to talk about the history of the Enneagram, I'm going to go all the way back and we're going to talk about six very specific data points when we talk about the history of the Enneagram. And these are really important because you've got to have a really clear understanding of what we're talking about when we say the Enneagram. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the symbol itself. So the symbol is part of what we call sacred geometry. Um, and this is this idea that shapes have a higher esoteric meaning. It can be traced back over 4,000 years to the followers of Pythagoras. So you see it in ancient Greece. And I'm not going to dive too deeply into kind of what the symbol means, but I am going to just give you a, a few small examples of when we say sacred geometry, what does that mean? So within the Enneagram, there's a circle and there are universal laws. This is the law of one. Um, so we talk about it, it's to be. And again, I'm not, this could be a whole class of just about, you know, the actual sacred geometry. So I'm just going to give you a taste, but that's the circle. There is a triangle within the Enneagram, and that is the law of three. And this is to know, it's this idea, there's an active, a passive, and a neutral force. And there is the irregular hexagon, uh, which represents the law of seven, this is sequence. And this is to understand. Um, so this is the symbol. And again, it goes back 4,000 years and we can trace it to ancient Greece. That's the symbol. But then if we fast forward to the 1900s and the Russian philosopher Gurdjieff, suddenly this kind of static symbol gains motion. So Gurdjieff was the first one to start to openly talk about this idea that this is a, a, a a symbol that has perpetual motion within it. So he talked about the arrows. He did not create this. He learned it and he started writing about it and teaching it. So this is where suddenly the static Enneagram kind of becomes the dynamic Enneagram. It's a schematic of perpetual motion. Where did he get his information? Uh, this is where it starts getting vague. Uh, he was a very well-traveled person who had a lot of knowledge. So we know he trained in the East. And he was one of the first people who started talking about the Enneagram is something that you could move on. You could physically put it down and move on it. And we know that Sufis were doing that. So there's an idea that there was a link between this perpetual moving Enneagram and Sufism, but it's not clear that that's where it came from. They just seems to be there, an implication that there was a link. Um, so why is this so important? Because this is the Enneagram that really the idea here is that you can take the Enneagram and think of it as a process map. So it's not just a, a symbol, it's almost like a methodology. Um, so again, because I come from a business background, I think of it, it's almost like the Six Sigma. You can take a body of information and if you place it correctly on the Enneagram using the sacred geometry, you can start to have a very full understanding of that body of knowledge. So this exists and Gurdjieff is the one who started to talk about, hey, there's motion here. Um, he also, as I, probably many of you know, he talked about the three centers. So when he was talking about human personality, he was the one who first talked about the head center, the heart center, and the body center. So this is all going on, and this is happening in around the 1920s, 1920s, 1930s. Fast forward 20 more years, and we get to Oscar E. Chazo. So now we move from Europe, and we go to South America. So Oscar E. Chazo was Bolivian born, and he was teaching in Chile. And he was a spiritual teacher who was teaching a lot of things. He started a school called the Arica School. And that school exists today. And the Arica School, you know, they, the explicit idea was it was to provide humanity with a complete and entire knowledge of our psyche to enable ourselves to handle our problems faster, faster, easier, and more clearly. So this is what the Arica School was trying to do, or is trying to do. The Enneagram concept was part of the teachings. It was not the only thing being taught. And a lot of people say it's actually the tip of the iceberg. There was a lot more going on. There is a lot more going on, but this is one element of it. So he takes the Enneagram process map and he layers on this idea of let's put on human psychology. You know, the Enneagram, you can use it for any vast body of knowledge. 
I am trying to help the world be able to understand its own psyche. I'm going to take human psychology and layer it onto this moving system of the Enneagram. So this is what he did. He did this um, in a kind of bare bones way. And, and I want to be careful when I say bare bones. What I mean is he did not list out the very detailed personality profiles that we see today. That was not his work. He was much more focused on the vices, the virtues, the ego formation. So what he was saying is we start off kind of messed up and I'm going to use the Enneagram to figure out how do you solve those problems. So he, he didn't have a single Enneagram. They talk about how he had 108 Enneagrams, but it was all different levels of looking at the vice, the virtue, the holy ideal. It was very specific aspects being layered onto the symbol. So this is what Ichazo did. So now we start to have the Enneagram of personality, but it's still very kind of bare bones. Um, then we move forward another 10 or 20 years and his student was Claudio Naranjo. So Claudio Naranjo was a Chilean psychiatrist and he was learning, he was training in the Arca school under Ichazo. He was exposed to the Enneagram and he fell in love with it. He thought this is amazing. And it makes a lot of sense because he's a psychiatrist. So he would really get amped up understanding like, wow, you can start to apply this map to the human psyche. He is the one who uh, kind of started to add all of the detail. He really fleshed it out. And there's a saying, if Ichazo was the father of the Enneagram who kind of planted the seed, it was Naranjo who was the mother who really birthed it. So when it came to Naranjo, that was when we started to get all of these detailed personality profiles. Um, so this is what this was his work. Um, and he was creating or he had groups called SAP, Seekers After Truth. So he was Chilean, but he was actually doing his work up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And he had these groups called SAP groups or Seekers After Truth. And he was teaching the Enneagram here. Um, and I just spoke with someone who was in one of those groups and she said, it was insane what we were doing, but you have to understand, we weren't learning the Enneagram. He didn't stand up and say, okay, here's the symbol, here's the nine types. It wasn't that he would use the Enneagram once again to kind of flesh into kind of the shadow side. And the whole point of his work was to figure out, okay, you're completely out of balance. How do we get you back in balance? What's wrong with kind of your personality structure? How do we move to kind of the, the more equalized version of it? So this was his work. Um, and for those of you who might have started, you know, your Enneagram journey reading Enneagram books, a lot of times people can think it's kind of negative. Like they focus a lot on what's wrong. And that is right because the be beginnings of the Enneagram were all about personal growth and spiritual evolution. So you've got to start with what's wrong so that you can start to bring that into balance. How it's being used now is a much wider spectrum. So in this wider spectrum, it can sound negative, but if your goal was you know, to absolutely raise your consciousness and get as close as you could to enlightenment, you would want to start in the darker areas. That would be a logical place. So that's kind of what happened there. So Naranjo is teaching away. He's got his small groups. He's very clear, mm, this is information just for these groups because it was almost the, almost the master disciple relationship. He wanted to contain how the information was disseminated. But the information got out, it leaked. Um, and I don't think it was a single leak. I think it was probably a lot of leaks, but people started talking. People became very enthusiastic and suddenly people are talking about the Enneagram. So it started to be that you could hear about the Enneagram without being in one of these groups. So at this point, the kind of the lineage of the Enneagram takes a little bit of, you know, two paths. Uh, there's the Jesuits and then there's the Helen Palmer narrative tradition. So the Jesuits got this information. They got the more bare bones from Ichazo and they got some notes from Naranjo. Uh, and there was a specific Jesuit who got very excited about it, started kind of pushing this out into the Jesuit community. And the seminarian, uh, Don Riso, took the information and just began doing research. And he researched for years and years, kind of applying human psychology, growth, everything he knew to come up with the body of information where he could write a book. So again, his book was called Personality Types. And the backbone of it was the Enneagram. He did a lot of his own research to come up with that. And exactly what he did, I, I wasn't there, I don't know, but it was a, a very much research driven thing. Um, on the other side, Helen Palmer, 
is learning the information from Naranjo. It's unclear if she was in a SAT group or not, but she was around it. Helen Palmer was an int intuition teacher. So she was an intuitive herself and she's teaching other people intuition. And then she starts to learn the Enneagram and she too becomes excited about it. So she took a different approach because she had been an intuitive teacher. She was used to what we call the narrative tradition where you get people to talk about their experience. So she's got the same, you know, kind of bare bones bit of information from Ichazo and Naranjo. She starts running with it, adding kind of the narrative tradition that she knows. So this is where her, her kind of perspective was coming from. And she wrote what I would consider to be the second book. So right around 1987, 1988, we've got two different books. And what's very impressive is that they basically had the same information. The presentation is slightly different, but it's roughly the same. So they kind of concluded they either had the same notes or they came to the same conclusions, but the nine types remained the nine types. There wasn't a lot of deviation. So this is where you'll see those kind of two lineages, both totally valid, but different. Um, so this is all moving along you know, the subtypes as an idea was always within this body of information, but it wasn't talked about very much. We didn't have a lot of detail around it. And what happened next was in 2004, Claudio Naranjo went to an, I, an International Enneagram Association conference, and he presented the 27 subtypes in great detail. And Beatrice Chestnut was there. She was blown away. Um, she thought the information was amazing. And so she, um, during that period, learned with the help of Naranjo and his associates that she was a self-preservation type two. And she hadn't known that, even though she'd been studying the Enneagram for a long time. So with this information, she said it was almost like she could see a new angle of her own mind. It really started to help her understand herself even better. She became very excited about the information and she was frustrated that nobody else in the community seemed as enthusiastic. So she's a researcher and she just went on a research project and started compiling every note, everything she could get about what Naranjo had said about the subtypes. And that is this book, which is the Complete Enneagram, which was published in 2013. If you don't have it, I highly, highly recommend it. This is probably the most detailed book about the subtypes. And it's, it's not necessarily that she came up with new information. She was really synthesizing everything that Naranjo had said. Um, so that is the history of the subtypes. And that is kind of how we got here today.